Okay, so summarizing what uh, we have seen this morning, uh, we are solving the convection diffusion reaction equation with, uh, for simplicity, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. And we have seen that the difference between the exact solution and the finite element solution behaves as, let me use this symbol because this is up to constants, in the H1 norm, in the H1 norm, as uh, H to the power of the polynomial order multiplied by the, well, the semi-norm of the exact solution in HK plus 1, if it is regular enough, if it is regular enough. And the important point is that there is a constant here that is the continuity of A divided by the coercivity of the bilinear form, that's the where the continuity of A behaves as K plus the, uh, let's say, L infinity norm of the velocity plus the reaction. If you want, you can put a length scale here and a length, square, uh, and a length scale squared here. And the coercivity constant behaves as K, and that's the problem, because when K is very small, we have a very large number here. This is the summary of what I have said. One important remark here is that these estimates are global in the whole computational domain omega. That means that, um, for example, these u minus uh in h1, in h1, is the integral over omega. For example, let, let's put only the gradient part because the the l2 part is controlled by by the uh, uh, gradient part using poincare friedrichs inequality. So this is essentially the integral over all omega over all the computational domain of, uh, of this difference, okay? So those are global estimates, global estimates. So sometimes, uh, and what happens with global estimates? What happens is that local oscillations are not avoided, are not controlled, okay? Why? Because, if, for example, imagine in 1D, in one dimension, you have a node here, you have a mesh like that, okay? And imagine the exact solution is like this, Suppose this is the exact solution. It might be very likely that the approximate solution is like that. Let's exaggerate that a little bit. Is like this. Okay, so that 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 it is very likely that the approximate solution looks like that. Okay, so with a big error at the points where the gradients of the solution are sharp. Okay, and if when you refine the mesh, when you make this smaller, those values more or less keep constant and with the same error. Okay? Why? Because when you refine the mesh, that estimate, of course, is true because the global norm decreases at the correct power of H. But nevertheless, you still have a big error at the, at the uh, let's say, discontinuity or sharp, sharp gradient of the solution. Okay? That happens. So how can you control these gradients, these uh, errors, in fact? Well, this is very much related to the so-called maximum principle, and that is uh, what is related here. I will only give a very brief introduction to that because this is a, um, a deep topic, but I think that knowing the basic idea is important. So let's recall the maximum or minimum principle for scalar equations. Pardon me? I'm sorry, I don't understand you. Norm of H1 you have written just a square root of <coughs> integral red u minus red u x. One L2 norm will be there. You do not what? One L2 norm will be in the addition. Well, this is the H1 norm. Yes, I, I said that the L2 norm is missing, but you can control the L2 norm by the by that norm because of Poincare Friedrich's inequality. Okay, do you understand? I said before that, I mean, very often you can take that as a definition of the H1 norm in the case in which the value of the unknown on the boundary is given, is zero, for example. Okay, so it's the same up to constants. Do you understand? Do you really understand what I said? Look, it's, it's written here. Here. You see? The gradient of V controls the whole H1 norm because of poincare friedrichs inequality. Okay, so very often one doesn't care about uh, the L2 part of the norm, and one only considers the 
L2 part of the derivative, okay, because of that, okay. So uh, uh, here we are. So uh, let's recall the maximum or minimum principle uh, for that solution. Suppose that we have a, a non-negative right hand side, and S is is non-negative. Then it turns out that the minimum of the solution in the whole domain omega, including the boundary, that's what that means, that's the closure of omega, so the omega plus the boundary, is equal to the minimum of the boundary data. Well, that in that case, the boundary data is not zero. If the boundary data is zero, it's just the zero, okay? So that means that for this type of equations, the so-called minimum principle holds, so that if f is positive, then you have that the minimum is reached, is attained on the boundary. Okay, that's the so-called minimum principle. This is a property of the continuous solution. It's a property of the partial differential equation we are solving. If S is equal to zero, then uh, when, when F is negative, the maximum principle holds. So that, that's why it's better to state the minimum principle because that also can account for the uh, positive reactive term. Okay? And remember that S cannot be negative. Cannot be negative unless, uh, because otherwise you would have a negative, a negative contribution that could lead to instabilities. By the way, just a, a parenthesis. What would happen if A is equal to zero, so we don't have convection, and S is negative? What would happen if S is negative? You if you look at this equation, who knows what happens? If we solve the equation minus K Laplacian of U minus S U equal to zero with S positive. So what happens if that coefficient is negative? Do you know that? Which equation would, it, would that be? That wouldn't be a, a Poisson type problem. The, the type of equation changes completely <laughs> just because of this sign. Do you know what equation is it with the minus sign? If I, if I say that S is equal to minus omega squared, so it, S is uh, negative, does that remind you anything? What? Oscillations, exactly. And do you know the name of the equation? It's called Helmholtz equation, Helmholtz equation, okay? So in the Helmholtz equation has to be studied using different techniques because, by the way, the instant condition also applies there. But it uh, has to be used a different thing. Why? Because it has, with, with a negative sign, um, that's, that equation has non-trivial solutions associated to the eigenvalue zero. So that means that there are solutions such that the operator is equal to zero and the, and the, and the function is not zero. So those are the traveling waves. Okay, so it's a solution that changes completely in nature just because of the change of the sign. Okay? So that's why, from the very beginning, I, I took S non-negative, okay? That's another story. Helmholtz equation is also very interesting. Uh, we could talk about that if you're interested, too, as well. Okay, so I was saying that with S positive, uh, F, S non-negative, and F non-negative, the minimum principle holds, okay? And with S equal to zero and F non-positive, the maximum principle holds. It's just uh, equivalent. Okay, so that's a property of the continuous solution. So now the question is, would that property, or is it possible that this property is inherited by the numerical approximation? Okay, that is essentially what is stated here. Suppose that the total number of nodes of the finite element mesh is that, n tp, and of, course, uh, and of those there are uh, n free number of free nodes. That means that they are interior without boundary terms. That you can identify both if the boundary condition is zero. So if, if the boundary condition is zero, you can identify both. Once the finite element discretization of the problem is done, you are, you are uh, uh, led to that system, AU equals F. That's the notation that I employed before. And as I said here, the boundary values from the free values to the total number of points are known from the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay? So this is not a square matrix in a, in a sense because you know uh, the values that correspond to the boundary nodes. That's the notation I have used. Okay? So those are the dimensions of matrix A and of the forcing term F. So it is said that the numerical method satisfies the discrete maximum principle if when F is positive, so the components of that vector F are positive for all vectors, then the minimum of A for the total number of points is attained on the boundary points. Okay, exactly the same. That's the discrete counterpart of, of um, of the previous property of the continuous solution. So that means that uh, the minimum of A is attained on the boundary. Okay? That's why we have to distinguish between the interior points and the boundary points. That on one side. On the other side, it happens that matrix A is called of non-negative ti non type if the following conditions hold. First, the 
of diagonal entries are non-positive, but when you add up all the uh, all the entries in a row, the result is um, non-positive, non-negative. Okay, so that means in a sense that the diagonal terms are positive and they dominate somehow the off-diagonal components. That is a matrix of non-negative type. There are also other, other, other results. In the literature, you can see similar results to what I will state here, but that is perhaps the, the simplest. OK, okay. a matrix of non-negative type satisfies these properties. So it turns out that a sufficient condition, a sufficient condition for the discrete maximum principle to hold is that the matrix of the system is of non-negative type. So if A, the matrix that you encounter, is of non-negative type, that A is of non-negative type, then the solution satisfies the discrete minimum principle. So the maximum or the minimum, sorry, is attained on the boundary, and the similar happens for the max. The, uh, the same happens for the max. Okay. So this is not difficult to prove. I, I will not prove that, but it's not difficult. So it's not a deep result that one. The problem is, or the fact is that that, that is an algebraic property. That is an algebraic property. You don't have to do. I mean, to relate uh, the, the, that problem to finite elements to prove that. So that's an algebraic property. So what happens when you relate that to finite elements? What happens is what is stated here. Okay, it turns out that when the discrete maximum principle holds, the finite element solution can be bounded in L infinity. The L infinity norm, as you know, is the is the norm of is the supremum of the function u over all the domains. So the, the the supremum, the maximum, if, if, the, if that value is attained, can be bounded in terms of the data, can be bounded in terms of the L infinity norm of the boundary conditions and the LP norm for P large enough of the, of the data. That's important, but not that important. What is really important is the second property is that you have convergence point-wise, because if the L infinity norm converges to zero with a rate k plus 1, essentially, in fact, is k plus 1 minus something as small as you wish, then if that converges to 0, the solution point-wise, will, the finite element solution point-wise will, will converge to the continuous solution. So that situation cannot happen because in that case, for example, you, you see that the error is fixed. The error is this, this gap between the finite element solution and the, and the continuous solution, and that gap is kept as you refine the mesh. If you have that property, that will not happen. Okay, the, the, uh, if you refine the mesh, the uh, finite element solution will converge to the exact solution. So the discrete maximum principle is uh, related to stability and convergence in L infinity. That's the situation. If we as have a matrix of non-negative type, then the discrete maximum principle holds, and that is easy to prove. And then stability and convergence, convergence in L infinity hold. That is not easy at all. Okay, that that's a deep result. That is uh, by no means easy. Well, in one dimension everything is easy, but in general it is not easy. Okay, so the point is that it seems that that property, or if you want this one, is important to have pointwise convergence. So there are many models, and nowadays it's uh, it used to be a very important topic, uh, maybe. 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the design of methods uh, of non-negative type with matrices of non-negative type, it was, I would say, forgotten for a while because it's a difficult topic. It's not easy. We will see why is it difficult. But I think now it's, um, you can see in the, in the in many papers dealing again with, uh, with that objective, the objective of getting a stability and convergence uh, in everything. What happens in the one-dimensional model problem using linear elements? So what's the, let's see what happened for our problem. And we can split the, the matrix of our system as a diffusion matrix plus a convective matrix plus a reactive matrix. Okay? And here the notation is that that is the matrix for one element. I know that you uh, know uh, well the approximation in 1D. So that those are the expressions that uh, we have for the diffusive matrix, the convective matrix, and the uh, um, uh, reactive matrix. Okay? So that is the gradient of the shape function of node A multiplied by the gradient of the shape function of node B, and that is equal to the AB component of the diffusive matrix. Something similar for the convective matrix and for the reactive matrix, okay? And that's integrated over an element. And then after, after you have the uh, matrices of each element, you know that uh, through assembly, you get the global matrix. Okay, what happens if we add up a row? If we add up a row, we see that that is going to be zero because when adding all the uh, shape functions n, 
you know that the sum of all shape functions is 1. That's a property. Well, you know that. Okay, perfect. In 1D, you know that. So the gradient of 1 is 0, and that cancels. So the, and that as well cancels. And that is uh, non negative because the integral of a, that, uh, that is 1 when we add for all b, that is 1. And then we have the integral of the shape function of a node, which is positive, And we said that s is non negative. So that is non negative. Perfect. So in order to check that, that our matrix is of non negative type, the only thing that we have to verify is that the off diagonal entries are non positive. Okay? The off diagonal entries are non positive. That is the one dimensional convection diffusion diffusion convection reaction equation. For example, with the simplest boundary condition u and, uh, equal to 0 at the edges, at, the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> at 1 and 0 in this case, or 0 and 1 in this case. Okay? So if you work out the expression of the element matrices using linear elements, what you find is uh, what is uh, written here. You see that the sum of the uh, diffusive term, the, the, ro the sum of the rows for the diffusive term and for the convective term is uh, 0. And only the reactive term remains. Okay, that's what you get. So you can see that matrix, the matrix A is of non-negative type if that condition in red holds. So what does that mean? It means that uh, that term, which is minus k divided by h, then we have either plus or minus. That's why I have put here plus minus. Either plus or minus diffusion. Uh, excuse me, velocity over two, convection over two, plus. SH over 6, that is non positive. That is the condition under which the discrete maximum principle holds. I mean, first, that the matrix is of non negative type, and second, that the discrete maximum principle holds. Okay, so what happens? <coughs> um, well, it's easy to check. Suppose that we, you don't have reaction, you, you have only the convection diffusion reaction equation. So S is equal to 0. If you want that to be fulfilled, you need that condition to hold, which you probably know from the analysis of the 1D case. You need that velocity times h divided by twice diffusion has to be smaller than 1. That is a dimensionless number. It can be checked that that number has no dimensions. So the units of velocity are length over time. The, uh, this is length, so this is length squared over time, which, is, which are the same units as the units of diffusion, length squared over time. So this is dimensionless. If this is smaller than 1, then you can guarantee that the discrete maximum principle will hold. And in the case in which you have no convection and only reaction, uh, that is the condition under which you can guarantee that the discrete maximum principle holds. This is called the reaction number, sometimes called also Dunkeller number, and this is called the Peclet number. Okay, good. Of course, these are sufficient conditions. If A is of non-negative type, so if that holds, if those conditions holds, A is of non-negative type, the discrete maximum principle holds, and you get the stability and convergence in L infinity. And therefore, you don't have oscillations, and you can prove point-wise convergence. Of course, all, that, all these are sufficient conditions. You don't have an implication on the other sense, okay? But those are important conditions. So what happens if it doesn't hold? <coughs> you know, when things can go wrong, they do go wrong. That's a general rule in, in, an, in medical analysis. You know, If they can go wrong, they will go wrong. And they do go wrong. <laughs> so when, when the reactive, when the Peclet number is uh, greater than 1, or that the Damkeller number is greater than 1, you do have oscillations. And that's what you get. For example, this is a very simple example, only convection diffusion. Um, this is uh, k is equal to 1, and there is the, the, the f is, equal, is constant, equal to 10 to the 4, and you have a, convec a convection. If convection is small, let's say this value, what you get is this profile, that's the unknown plotted against uh, x and y. Okay? Those are the x, y axis, and this is the unknown. So that's perfect. You have a very smooth solution obtained using uh, key one elements, so linear, uh, bilinear elements they are called. If you increase convection, things, uh, I mean, the effect of convection can be, a pre, uh, can be observed, but still you have a smooth solution. When you multiply convection by 100, then you get oscillations everywhere. So you see, you get, in the case of convection-dominated problems, this is a general conclusion, oscillations spread all over the computational domain. Okay? That has to be kept in mind. Oscillations spread all over the computational domain. In the case of reactive dominated cases, 
So we have k equal 1, no convection, so only reaction diffusion. F, again, 10 to the 4. If, uh, if we have S equals 1, so reactive is not important, we get essentially the same solution as here. So S is not important. But if S dominates, of course, if S dominates, if S is 10 to the 4, you see, F, if S is 10 to the 4 and F is 10 to the 4, so if this is 10 to the 4 and this is 10 to the 4, and this is a small, essentially the solution is U equals 1. Okay? Because if that's 10 to the 4 and that's 10 to the 4, the solution is U equal to 1. So you, uh, you, you plot the solution and it's almost 1 everywhere except close to the boundary where you have oscillations. You have this lack of satisfaction of the discrete maximum principle. Okay? But another important um, conclusion that may be drawn from this uh, plot is that oscillations do not propagate over the computational domain. And that's also a general trend. In the case of reactive dominated flows, you have oscillations, but contrary to what happens with, with convection dominated flows, they don't propagate over the computational domain. They stay uh, close to boundaries. Okay? And if you refine the mesh, you get better and better solution, of course, with the same overshoots and undershoots up to the point in which the Damkeller number or reaction number is smaller than 3. Okay? Do you get the, the overall picture? Okay, so that's for the convection diffusion reaction equation. So we have seen only that the Golurkin method fails. That section is called instability problems of the Golurkin method. Okay, I'm still talking about the Golurkin method. So the Golurkin method fails. Why? Because of the reasons that we've seen. This, on the one side, we have seen that this coefficient is high, is large. If this coefficient is large, that estimate is, is uh, meaningless. And on the other side, we don't have the discrete maximum principle. And therefore, we may have local oscillations. That, that's the summary of what we have been saying so far. Let's go to the Stokes problem. That chapter is about convection diffusion reaction. But for the argumentation, it is also interesting to consider the Stokes problem that I know that you uh, uh, or also know. The Stokes problem is this one. We want to find the velocity. So that's a velocity field, U, which is a vector field, and a, a scalar field, P, called pressure, such that these two equations hold. We have minus Laplacian of u plus gradient of p equals to f and divergence of u equal to zero. We will see later in the following chapter the mathematical structure of this problem. That's not what we are interested in now. <coughs> um, first, the only thing you, we have to notice is that this is a vector equation and this is a scalar equation. <coughs> so that can be understood. That scalar equation um, can be understood as the equation for the for p, the, the function p which we will see acts as a Lagrange multiplier, but we will see that uh, later in chapter 2. OK, which is the functional setting of this problem? So <coughs> I will not do the details, but they are not difficult to follow. It turns out that the, the bilinear form of the problem, taking as capital U the unknown velocity pressure, so the couple velocity pressure, which is the unknown of the problem, and capital V, the uh, velocity and pressure test functions, so th those are the test functions, Multiplying the first equation by V and the second equation by Q, what you get is this bilinear form of the problem. So we get the same term as for the convection diffusion equation. I'm using here the standard notation that the parentheses mean L2 product, so the integral of the product of the two functions. So that's the standard. So that's what you get from this term in black. From the integration by parts of the second term, I, don't, I won't do the details here. Maybe I'll do that later for Navier-Stokes. You get this minus p divergence of v. So that's what you get when you integrate by part this term. And I I here in this term, you don't do anything. You just multiply by a test function q, a pressure test function q, and you integrate over omega. So that's what you get. And the right-hand side is just uh, what you get here. It's uh, v times f. So which is the functional setting of the, mo of the problem? Just uh, to, to say it rapidly, if we want this to be finite, we require that the velocities have to be in H1, exactly for the same reasons as for the convection diffusion reaction equation, exactly for the same reason. If now we have that velocities are in H1, that will be an L2 function, and that will be an L2 function, because those are derivatives of the velocity trial solutions and velocity test functions. And therefore, if you want this to be bounded, if you want this to be finite, the pressure has to be in L2. Okay, that's L2. So we know that this is H1 for velocities, L2 for pressures. What does that mean? <coughs> Look at, this at these equations. If I have a constant, uh, excuse me, I have a solution P. I have a solution P. 
if to that p I add a constant, nothing will change because the gradient of a constant is zero. Okay, therefore that that problem of course does not have a unique solution. Of course it does. It, it is obvious. So how can we make solutions unique? We can make solutions unique by identifying all functions that differ by a constant. If the difference between two functions is a constant, a constant means that does not depend on position x, then I, I identify those functions. So that defines a so-called uh, equivalence relationship. I don't know how much you know about that. That's uh, set theory. That defines an equivalence relationship that in turn defines an equivalent class, it said, you know, that, uh, that's an equivalent class. So that's, uh, that's uh, what it means. It means that the, uh, the space of functions for the pressure are L2, but identifying pre uh, functions that differ by a constant, by a real number, okay? And that's read, the way it, th this expression is read is that this is L2 modulo constants, modulo constants. And it can be shown that in this space, the solution is unique. Okay. So the Stokes problem consists of finding a, velocity, uh, a pair of velocity pressure in our space, which is, uh, of course, is uh, the velocity space cross the pressure space, such that this variational equation holds for all test functions. And as you see, I have written, can, can you all see that uh, from the bottom? Do you see that from the rear of the room? Not very well. Um, it's difficult because uh, maybe if I take this out, do you see the equation? You just have to see once. So I have written the two equations as a single equation, if you want to look here, as b of u, u, v equal to L of v, as a single equation. But we have two equations. How is it possible? I will use that argument uh, again, so let me explain it. It's trivial, it's very simple, but I will use it again. So. That has to hold for all functions v. If that, ho if that holds for all functions v, I, capital V, I can take first uh, that function equal to v, an arbitrary test function for velocity, and zero for the pressure. What will I get if I do that? If I take the test function equal to zero for the pressure, that term will be zero. Okay, that term will be zero, and that will have to be equal to v times f. So I will recover, by taking the test function for, for the pressure equal to zero, I will recover the weak form of the first equation. Okay. Whereas if I take now v equal to zero, little v equal to zero, and q uh, arbitrary, I will get that this is going to be zero, this is going to be zero, and I will get that the integral of q times divergence of u has to be zero, because there is no uh, q on the right hand side. Therefore, I will get the weak form of the second equation. So it is very convenient to write the weak form of the Stokes problem as a single variational equation. Okay? V, excuse me, B of U, V equals to L of V. That's the abstract way of writing variational problems. Okay? So that's very convenient. Okay. What happens when you use the Golurkin method? We will go back to this point, but uh, just a brief uh, overview that is uh, related to the instability of the Golurkin method. What happens when you try to solve that using the Golurkin method? So you have to construct finite element spaces for the velocity and for the pressure of size h, okay? finite element spaces. Then the discrete problem is very simple. You just have to replace the continuous solution by the discrete solution. So you, it's very easy to write that down, you know. You just to, co to code it is more difficult, <laughs> but to write the problem is very simple. You just replace u by uh and v by vh, as simple as that. Nothing else, okay? So you you seek the solution in the finite element space and you test the solution against against finite element functions. Again, if we take uh, the first uh, the test function with only velocity entries and zero pressure entries, and then the other way around, we get those variational equations in discrete form. Okay, those are the variational equations in discrete form. And the matrix expression, without going into the details, which is the matrix expression of these uh, two equations? So first we have a, a, a matrix multiplying the velocity degrees of freedom that comes from this component, you see? That will lead a matrix, uh, doesn't mind exactly which are the components of this matrix. It, they are written here, but uh, whatever minus a matrix multiplying the pressure degrees of freedom equal to right hand side. 
and we have another matrix multiplying the velocity degrees of freedom equal to zero. And it turns out that those matrices are one the transpose of the other, as you can see from this expression, because those two equations are, uh, those two terms are exactly the same, but in one case we have the pressure unknown, and here the pressure test function, and here the velocity test function, and here the velocity unknown. So those matrices are the same, but one the transpose of the other. Okay? So that, this is the algebraic form of, uh, of that system which is the expression of the first matrix K that comes from here. So the, uh, the expression is this one. For all velocity components and, and, velocity, and velocity test function components, we have the same entry. That's why we have this Kronecker delta here. So, and the entry is gradient of the shape functions for the velocity and gradient of the shape functions for the velocity. Here, node A and node B. I don't want to enter the details here. I may, maybe I will insist later, but it's just a matrix. And something similar for the matrix uh, D. So here we have the uh, test functions of the velocity. So that will be expanded in terms of the shape functions. And again, the pressure will be expanded in terms of the shape functions. So what we have is here. You see that the shape functions for the pressure are not uh, differentiated. So that, that, that subscript P means shape function for the pressure whereas we have the derivatives of the shape function of the velocity. Okay? As you see here, I have introduced a, a subscript to the note that we, have, we may have different interpolation functions for the velocity and the pressure. Okay? And U and MP denote the velocity and pressure shape function, respectively. Okay? Well, okay, that's what we have. So now we want to see whether this problem at the algebraic level, or if you want at the variational level, it doesn't matter, this discrete problem is well posed or not. What does it mean well posed? That there exists a solution, and that solution is unique and can be bounded in terms of the data. That, that's what uh, well posedness means. Okay? We can bound the solution in terms of the data. So um, how do you do that? Um, the simplest way, the simplest, uh, the most straightforward way is first to take the test function equal to the unknown and see what happens. Okay? That's the, uh, what we have seen to check whether the method is coercive or not. We have seen that coercivity implies uh, invertibility of the operator and therefore uh, well poseness of the problem. So let's do that. If we take the test function equal to the unknown, what happens? Hmm. Here is uh, what we get. If we take V equals to U and Q equals to P, here we have a, a nu by the way, I didn't say that this is called diffusion, or uh, excuse me, viscosity, okay, or kinematic viscosity, that coefficient. It's not K diffusion as before, but kinematic viscosity. So we have, in case V is equal to U, we have the L2 norm of the gradient of U, but what happens with this term? This term cancels, because P divergence of U is zero. P divergence of U is zero. So w the only thing we have is nu gradient of U, okay? And of course, that has to be equal, sorry, that has to be equal to f of u, f of u, which is f, uh, the integral of f multiplied by u. That can be shown to be uh, bounded by what we called before the h minus norm of f and the h1 norm of u. Anyway, the important point is that we have u on the right hand side and u squared on the left hand side. And therefore, uh, using Poincare Friedrich's inequality, so that that can bound, that bounds the whole H1 norm, using poincare friedrichs inequality, we see that we get this estimate, that the H1 norm of U is bounded in terms of the data and divided by this cost. But the important point is that we can bound the velocity in terms of the data. So velocity is controlled. But what about the pressure? The pressure, you know, it's not that easy to bound. I mean, if we want to extract stability from the pressure, where we have to look at? I mean, we only have one place to look at. The only uh, term that involves pressure is this one. That's the only term that involves pressure. So if we have to be able to bound the pressure, to obtain a, nor a, a bound for the norm of the pressure, we have to rely on this term because we have nothing else. So we have to rely on that. Okay. okay. And if we rely on that, what do we have? If we rely on that, we have that P divergence of V because of the equation is equal to viscosity gradient of U gradient of V minus F V. That's just because of the equation. And of course, if I want to bind that to bound this, 
that is going to be smaller than I have a control on you. So the, the control, uh, the H1 norm of U, H1 norm of V, F minus 1 norm, excuse me, H minus 1 norm of F and H1 norm of V. And since that is controlled by the H minus 1 norm of F, uh, by the way, viscosity the width cancel, I have this estimate. I have this estimate. Perfect. I have that P divergence of B is bounded by this. And I have V on the left and V on the, on the right. And that's the only place where pressure appears. So, so the only way to control pressure is from this term. So if this is the only term where I can control pressure, it is very easy to foresee which is the condition that I will need to control the pressure. The condition that I will need is that that is a sort of inverse coercivity. So that, uh, or excuse me, inverse continuity. So we know by continuity that the, the L2 norm of or, or Schwarz inequality, if you want, that's a sort of inverse Schwarz inequality. The Schwarz inequality tells me that the norm, excuse me, the, that the L2 product of P divergence of B is bounded from above, from below, by the norm of P and the norm of divergence of U. But now I want the opposite. Why? Because I want to get control on the norm of P. So I need this condition to hold. I need that P divergence of B is greater or equal a constant times P in, a, in L2. When I don't put a subscript, I mean the L2 norm, and V in H1. That's what I need. Because I want to control P. And it's the only place, the only way to have control on P. Okay? But of course, I don't need that to hold for all V. Not for all V. No, for all V would be continuity, the inverse of continuity, okay? the opposite of continuity. But I don't need for all V. I need that you give me P, my pressure, and I have to find a certain V that satisfies that. As soon as I find one, I have enough. Why? Because if that holds, then for a, for a, given, P, for a given V, v uh, for a given P, I find a single V, then I can use this, and you see, V, the norm of V will cancel from the right hand side and the left hand side, and I will have the L2 norm of P bounded. Okay, we will see that property later when talking about the Stokes problem in more detail. But the, 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 the emphasis, uh, by the way, we will see that from another point of view. But um, here, the only thing I want to emphasize is that that condition is very natural, is the only point that is the only term where pressure appears, and therefore, it's the only term from where we can extract pressure stability. Okay? And the natural condition is that one. And that can be expressed, it, it is easy to see that that can be expressed in this way, where B of PV is nothing but the integral of P divergence of B. Okay? That can be expressed in this way, because if you uh, prove that that, that holds, that is equivalent to say that the minimum of that quotient for the supremum that you can find for all test the functions of velocity is uh, greater or equal a certain constant b okay you just move that uh, uh, as uh, dividing you just move this uh, dividing and if uh, if that exists for all p it will exist for the infimum and if there exists uh, v that can be taken as the supremum of this co of this quotient okay so those co two conditions are equivalent i prefer this one i think it's more illustrative it, I mean, this way to write the problem, that for all pressures, I can find the velocity test function such that this condition holds, okay? And it turns out that if that condition holds, if that condition holds, you have this estimate. You have this estimate that was proved by, by Vrenzi in, in his paper. That's why this condition is often called babuchka Vrenzi or ladicenskaya babuchka Vrenzi condition. I, I will explain later when talking about the Stokes problem, why is it called Vladislavskaya babuchka Bredzi? Bredzi proved that. Pro he proved that the error in velocities in H1 plus the error in pressures in L2, remember that the velocity space is H1, the velocity space is H1 and the pressure space is L2. So the error in velocities in H1 plus the error in pressures in L2 is bounded by a constant times these two uh, expressions terms. And this term is what? This term is the distance of VH to the, to the exact velocity. And this is the distance that should be uh, calligraphic V, sorry. That should be calligraphic V and calligraphic Q. And that's the distance from 
the space QH to P. So this is optimal. That's the, what we said this morning, you remember? If I am able to find that the error of my finite element solution is bounded by the interpolation error of, of, the, of the finite element space, I can say that my method is optimal. Okay? And moreover, you can even prove that estimate for the velocity, you can prove an, uh, the estimate in L2. So that again <coughs> uh, uses, makes use of um, uh, Ovid Nietzsche's uh, strategy. Okay, so we have seen two problems. Now I could say the same as before. We said before that if the, um, what is the bottom line of, w of what I have said this morning and up to now? If, <coughs> if the um, Peclet number or the, the Dunkeler numbers in the convection diffusion reaction equation are not as smaller than one and three respectively, we may have problems. Reality says that we do have problems. In the case of the Stokes problem, if uh, the im sub condition does not hold, the only thing we can say is that pressure is out of control because we don't have control on the pressure if that condition does not hold. Reality says that pressure is oscillating, it's completely wild, okay, uh, if you don't satisfy that condition. So, when things may go wrong, they do go, go wrong. That's what I said before. So, when the Peclet and the Damkeller numbers are large in the convection diffusion equation, you have oscillations. When that condition is not met in the case of the Stokes problem, we have pressure oscillations pressure oscillations, not velocity oscillations. Okay? Well, velocities are not very good, but not oscillating. That's the message. So something has to be done. So you see that we have two different sources of problems. One is uh, high convection uh, and high reaction, and the other is that compatibility condition. That compatibility condition, we will see that later when talking about the Stokes problem in detail, but you see that there's a relationship between the pressure interpolation and the velocity interpolation. So in fact, what uh, that is a condition posed on the interpolating space for velocity and pressure. This is uh, a condition that happens. This is uh, a mixed interpolation condition is set sometimes because the Stokes problem is sometimes called a mixed problem in the sense that it involves variables with different character. Okay, in the sense that, that involves variables with different character, velocity and pressure. So this is a mixed problem. And we have a compatibility condition between the spaces, whereas in the case of convection diffusion equation, we have another type of instabilities that arises wh when k is small. From the mathematical point of view, or from the point of view of partial differential equations, you know what type of problem do we have when k is small? This is from this point of view of partial differential equations. When k is very small, we have a problem called singular perturbation problem. Exactly. What does it mean, singular perturbation problem? A singular perturbation problem is a problem in which the equation has a parameter, and when, the, and when that parameter goes to zero, the functional setting changes. That's what happens. What happens for this equation? For this equation, it happens that when k is positive, uh, the solution has to belong to H1. And in particular, you can prescribe boundary conditions all over the boundary, all over the boundary, okay? Whereas when k is exactly zero, when k is exactly zero, that, condi that equation is not parabolic anymore, excuse me, it's not uh, elliptic anymore. You know that that can be classified according to the quadratic form of the differential operator. Uh, we'll skip that. But that condition, the, the convection equation alone, requires boundary condition only on the inflow, that is when the normal and the velocity point in opposite directions that intuitively it's very easy to understand what is the inflow of the computational domain that's where the velocity points inwards okay so for that equation you only need to prescribe boundary condition on the inflow whereas if k is positive you have to prescribe boundary conditions everywhere in particular when k is positive the solution belongs to h1 and when k is zero exactly zero it has to be only the streamline derivatives, only the derivatives in the direction of u have to be a square interval. Not all derivatives, but all derivatives, only derivatives in the direction of u. So the functional setting of the problem changes when k is positive or when k is equal to zero. Hmm? So that's why this is called a singular perturbation problem. Do you know of any other singular perturbation problem? Which one? 
Which one? Which problem do you know of singular perturbation type? Any problem. There are many, in a, oh, there are several in the applications. For example, in structural mechanics, in, 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 in mechanics of solids, there are many. There are several uh, singular perturbation problems. Does anybody know about uh, beam theory, for example? No. <laughs> People coming from engineering. Who comes from engineering here? Does anybody come from engineering? Nobody comes from engineering. Who? Nobody. Oh, oh one person. <laughs> Two people sitting there. That, okay, you also come from engineering. So, uh, do you know a little bit about the structural mechanics? No, you don't know. Do you know what a beam, a beam is? A beam Have you heard about Euler's beam and Timoshenko's beam? Or thick beams and thin beams? Oh, that's difficult to explain. But uh, then, but y there are very problems in which when the parameter tends to zero, the equation changes type. For example, in plate theory or in beam theory. Um, when you have thick uh, plates, a plate that is relatively thick, you have one set of equations, which are the so-called, in the case of plate, are called reisner mittling uh, plate problems. Okay? When the thickness goes to zero, the equation is completely different, and you get the so-called Kirchhoff law theory. Okay? But the point is that the functional setting of the problem changes completely when the thickness goes to zero. In one case, you have a system of second order equations, and in the other case, you have uh, a fourth order equation. You know, the Bernoulli beam or the uh, thin, thin plates satisfy or are modeled by a fourth order equation. Okay? Um, well, that happens very often. That happens, in, in, for example, in shells or, or not even in shells, in membranes, uh, you also have singular perturbation problems, or even, even in porous media flow, you have singular perturbation problems. I mean, they appear very often. And the concept is that when one of the coefficients tends to zero, or one, is, or one of the coefficients of the equation is zero, the functional setting changes. So when the, that coefficient is not zero, but is very small, you may encounter problems. Uh, from the mathematical point of view, or from the continuous point of view, those problems are interesting because uh, you, know, you have so-called boundary layers, you have um, um, you want to study the, uh, the asymptotic behavior as the solution um, as the parameters go to zero. There is all a, a whole theory about that. Have you ever heard about asymptotic analysis, for example? Well, anyway, it's, it's a whole world, okay, at the continuous level. And at the numerical level, at the numerical level, you have oscillations. <laughs> so and at the numerical level, that, that's it's our interest now, what you have is oscillations, okay? So the conclusion is that uh, we have instability problems from two very different sources. Mixed problems, mixed interpolations, and singular perturbation problems. But both, in both cases, the Golurkin method fails. Okay? That's the conclusion. So we have to remedy that. We have to heal that misbehavior of the Golurkin method. And that's why stabilization techniques are designed for. Okay? So let's uh, th th those stabilization techniques began in the late 70s, beginning, yes, in the, no, in the late 60s, beginning of the 70s, in 1970s, something. Now the, the, the first paper is uh, by the end of the 70s. And uh, can be explained originally for the convection diffusion equation. And it, they, are, they are easy to understand. So, what I will explain here is, I, I, I would say, easy to understand. So suppose that we want to solve the one-dimensional convection diffusion equation, only convection and diffusion with given boundary values. Okay? We consider a uniform partition of the domain, 0L, with uh, size H, and we have uh, nodes ranging from, from 0 to N. Okay? And as we have seen, there is a number that plays a key role in, in the solution of that problem, which is the Peclet number, the element Peclet number, which is defined here. It turns out, I have an, in fact, uh, you can obtain these equations from these uh, matrices that uh, are written here. But it turns out that when you discretize the problem using linear elements, you get a generic equation of this form. That's what you get. In the case, uh, the right-hand side is 0, you say. The right hand side is zero. So that's the general equation. So at a given node m, at a given node m, the equation that you get is this one. So one minus the Peclet number times the 
no, the, the unknown at node m plus 1 minus 2 the unknown at node m plus 1 plus the prepared number at node m minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, it's very, I don't know if I need to, to draw it. Maybe I will, but it's, um, it's I think, very easy to follow. So I have a node m, that's node m plus 1, that's node m minus 1. Here I have the unknown u at node m, whatever it is, u at m plus 1, and u at m minus 1. Okay? And h is the size of the elements, which uh, I have assumed to be constant. Okay. So that's what the question you get. And Peclet um, is the Peclet number defined here. Of course, when the Peclet number is zero, when the velocity is zero, you get the classical stencil for the diffusion, of, uh, diffusion operator. Okay. So u, uh, u m plus one minus two u m plus u m minus, minus one equal to zero. That's the stencil for the second order uh, derivative. Okay. Uh, now, Oh, uh, the, the important comment is that that is, a scheme is also found when you use centered finite differences. That's the, that's the expression that you use to approximate second de the derivatives at the node m, and that's the expression you use to approximate first derivatives of node m. Okay? So you approximate first derivatives of node m up to second order by u m plus 1 here, minus u m minus 1, and of course divided by twice the size of the uh, partition, okay? the, the distance between them. Okay? Okay, that's what you get. Now, when we use finite differences, you know that there is uh, the way to check which is the local error, because in finite differences everything is local, everything is done approximating derivatives, is to, uh, to expand the exact solution, to expand the exact solution at node uh, m, which would not be um, but u at xm, at the, at the coordinate at that node, in terms of the solution at the, at the neighbor nodes, and what you get for the exact solution, not for the approximate solution, but for the exact solution is that you, if you ins use uh, th those quotients to approximate the exact solution, you don't get that this is equal to zero. But this is equal to k star times the second derivative of the continuous solution. Okay? That's the classical technique used to check with the, which is the local error in finite differences. And in that case, if you uh, work out the expression that you get for that k star, you get this. You get this expression for that scheme. Okay, for that scheme, you get this expression. So it turns out that you don't solve the equation exactly. Of course, you would get exact nodal values if you would, but uh, you have an error that is called local truncation error. I don't know if I said the name here, but that's the so-called local truncation error in the case of finite uh, finite differences. I haven't said the word here, but uh, I mean it's called local truncation error, given by this expression. This is hyperbolic cosine of the Peclet number, twice the Peclet number, and this is the hyperbolic sign of uh, twice the Peclet number. Okay? And the important thing is that that uh, depends on one over the Peclet number and another one over the Peclet number. Hmm. So we may get into trouble because if you expand using Taylor series um, this term, you know that it is essentially one, uh, excuse yes, it's one plus something linear with the Peclet number plus something quadrat, uh, uh, and that's it. One plus something linear with the Peclet number. Perfect, because one will cancel with this one, so, we w so that will be linear with the Peclet number. That dependence on the Peclet number will cancel with this one, but we have another Peclet number here. Hmm. And that might be a problem. So that will grow, the point is that that K star will grow when the Peclet number uh, is large. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've said that the other way around. Uh, I, uh, yes, yes, no, no, I said that the, uh, in the correct sense, okay? I said that in the correct sense. And the same for that one. In fact, that's what is said here. That's the, oh, yes, I said here, the truncation error of the scheme is this one, and you can prove that when k, go, uh, that k goes to zero when the Peclet number goes to zero, okay? If the Peclet number is small, if the Peclet number is small, then you can show that that goes to zero, okay? Okay, so now if we look at that equation, if we look at that equation, we see that the equation that we are solving exactly when, uh, when using those schemes, or these, these two approximations of the derivatives, is in fact this one. So that is what the Galerkin method, in fact, solves. It doesn't solve the original equation. It doesn't solve that equation exactly. 
but it solves this equation exactly. Okay. But what's the problem? The problem is that that k star is positive. That k star is positive, and therefore k minus k star, which is what we could call the effective diffusion of the method, is smaller than the real diffusion. So uh, we have a first explanation, intuitive explanation that was given, as I said, in the 70s and the early 80s of the Golurkin method. That's, a, that's an expression that you can find sometimes in the literature. It said that the Golurkin method solves exactly an under-diffusive equation. Or if you want, it introduces an artificial negative diffusion. So that diffusion is negative. It is subtracting diffusion. So that's the interpretation we can give to the Golurkin method. What we have seen so far is just uh, formal, it's mathematical. Now we are going into the detail of the, of the uh, one-dimensional equation and see what happens in that case. Okay? In the one-dimensional equation, we see that it solves exactly an under-diffusive equation. That's one point. Another point of view, closely related to what I said, is that in fact we can solve this, uh, this difference scheme. This difference scheme can be solved exactly. There are techniques to solve that, like, like, uh, like differential equations. It's something very similar. Uh, so what is the technique? The technique is to assume that uh, the technique is to assume that um, uh, you get the solution for the homogeneous problem of the form a certain power instead of an exponential to the eigenvalue, which is the, 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 what you use in in, in, uh, in differential equations. You get a certain power of of a, of a, of, a, of a parameter lambda, call it uh, whatever, and then you have to find that lambda that for which the solution is satisfied. Anyway, it turns out that the solution the, the solution to the finite difference equation is given by this expression. This is very illustrative where C1 and C2 are constant fixed by the boundary conditions. Okay, this is very, very illustrative. Why? Because we see that when the Peclet number is higher than 1, that uh, the, the denominator is negative. So it changes. Uh, so we have that uh, uh, to the power of m. So when m is even, that's going to be positive. And when m is odd, that's going to be negative. You see? So we clearly see, I mean, we cannot see it more clearly than here with the explicit expression of u. We clearly see that we will have oscillations as soon as the Peclet number is higher than 1. Okay? So we cannot go, <laughs> let's say, uh, lower than that. That's the real detail of the thing. Okay. So <coughs> uh, oscillations are found when the Peclet number is uh, 1. Okay? So now that we have seen that oscillations appear and that the Golurkin method subtracts diffusion, what was the first idea? In the finite difference context, that is not finite elements, this is uh, finite difference. The first idea is, OK, if the Golurkin method subtracts stability, uh, diffusion, let's put it from the very beginning. OK, let's put diffusion from the very beginning. And the idea is, OK, let's introduce a numerical diffusion, an artificial numerical diffusion of this form, k prime, we will add it from the very beginning of the form, a certain parameter alpha, dimensionless, that we will see uh, how it behaves, times velocity times h divided by 2. It is dim this has units of uh, diffusion, so that's length over time multiplied by length, so this length is square over time, so this diffusion multiplied by a certain tuning parameter, okay, by a certain tuning parameter. So the idea is, since the Golurkin method will subtract uh, diffusion, let's put it from the beginning. That idea, by the way, I don't say that here, but it's due to von Neumann. No, you know, the same von Neumann that did the stability analysis, the same guy. Okay? So th this is from the 50s. Okay? From the 50s. And let's do the same if we put that diffusion, that diffusion from the very beginning. If we put this diffusion from the very beginning, the stencil, the equation that we obtain at, uh, for row number m, is this one. So we have a modification in terms of that parameter alpha, of that parameter alpha. So the modification we have is this one. So instead of having 1 minus the Peclet number, we have 1 plus the Peclet number, number times 1 minus alpha. Here we have also the influence of alpha and the influence of alpha. So that's what we get. If you, if you work out the uh, expression of the equations, that's what you get. And if you obtain the truncation error, and you expand a little in Taylor series and so on, what you get is that. You what you get that. So perfect. Now what is the idea? The idea is okay, what if we take alpha such that the truncation error is zero at node i? 
So the local truncation error at a certain point is zero. So if we impose the local, the local truncation error to be zero, what we get is an expression for alpha. We just have to equate that, uh, that the square bracket to zero. And that gives us an expression for alpha, which is this famous function, which is the hyperbolic cotangent of the Peclet number minus 1 over the Peclet number. Okay? This is sometimes called, I mean, that has funny names. This is obsolete. I mean, this is old, or what I'm saying. It's just to motivate what will come. Okay? That is sometimes called the magic function or whatever. Okay. Good. So that was the first idea, add diffusion. That's the first magic, as if given by this expression. Okay, given in fact by this expression. What if we have? Um, um, well, no, let's give another interpretation to that. That is very useful. Oh, it can be shown that you get exactly the same expression, the same expression, that 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 equation for the uh, nodal values, if you approximate the, the the first derivative using this expression which is not centered, you see? That's an approximation of the first derivative at node m. Usually, if we take alpha equal to 0, alpha equal to 0, what we get is what I said before, u m plus 1 minus u m minus 1 divided by 2h. However, if alpha is not 0 and we want to recover this, uh, this expression, what we have is that approximation to the first derivative, OK? So we see that what we have done introducing, introducing uh, that artificial diffusion is changing the approximation to the first derivatives using finite differences. So summary, the introduction of, the f of artificial diffusion is equivalent to change the approximation of the first derivatives using finite differences, OK, using finite differences. By the way, in the case alpha equals one, in the case alpha equals one, you see that we have here, we, we don't have u, u m minus one, that is equal to zero. Here we have that two, if the alpha is equal to one, that two would cancel with that two, and that we have a two here, we would have two here. So we have, in the case alpha equal to one, we have u m minus u m minus one divided by h. So the approximation of the derivative here is equal to u m minus u m minus one divided by h. Okay, which is the order of this approximation? Which is, this, which is the order of that approximation of the derivative here? So the, the u m minus u m minus one divided by h. How much? Which is what? Is I'm sorry, don't understand. Oh. It's backward, but no, no, the order. I'm talking about the order only. It's first order. It's a first order approximation, no, it's not second, it's first order. And as you say, it's a backward Euler approximation. In the case of a space, it's not called backward, it's called upstream. Okay? Why upstream? Because the velocity, we have assumed everywhere that A is positive, so we have an advection from the left to the right. So we are, we are taking the first derivative upstream. Okay? That's, called, uh, that's called upstream approximation. And that's called also not upstream, in fact, the word that is used is upwind. Okay? That's, uh, Alpha equals one is called full upwind. Okay, alpha equals one is full. Up. And in fact, when choosing alpha, you are tuning the amount of upwind. Okay, you are weighting more the nodes that are upstream or upwind the flow. Okay, that is all. <laughs> now that I'm talking, I see that it, this is all old terminology. Okay, but uh, in fact, it's needed to understand what comes. But uh, now, not everybody talks about upwind and upstream and all those terms. Maybe upstream is still used, but uh, not that much as it used to be uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And what happens in the context of finite elements? In the context of finite elements, this is important. Because in the context of finite elements, this is the weak form of the Golurkin method when we add diffusion, the Golurkin method of the continuous probe. Okay? When we add diffusion, we just have to add to k, we have to add this. Okay? We have to add this term when we add, have k. And now we could do the following. Since we have velocity here and velocity here as well, we can group together these two terms. You see, the velocity term and that term can be grouped together. If we do that, we have this. So we have the diffusive term as it was in the original equation, and the advective term or the transport term, the convective term, multiplied now not by v, the test function, but by v plus alpha h over 2 times the derivative of v 
over uh, with respect to x. Well, that's interesting because now we can give the following interpretation of that uh, addition. Remember, we are just adding diffusion, nothing else, plain diffusion. Find the difference. Find the differences. We are differentiating upstream. Find the elements. We are modifying the weighting function, but only for the convective term. That that green is not very appropriate. It looks better on the screen that uh, that's there. But I hope you can read it. So what we are doing, we can understand an interpretation we can give is that we are changing the test function for the convective term from v to uh, bar b. Okay, we are modifying the test function for the convective term in this way. Okay, and that that justifies a name when the test functions do not belong to the same space as the uh, as the finite element solution or the unknowns in general. The method is not called Golurkin but Petrov Golurkin. Mm -hmm. So the methods that will come and that appeared in those times were called Petrov Golurkin methods in the same in the sense that we were changing the test function function from V to something else, uh, but in this case only in the convective term. And nowadays, by the way, petrov golurkin methods are again um, of importance in other contexts because of methods that uh, are designed also to stabilize with, with another point of view. By the way, in ISIS as well, they, they are doing that uh, petrov golurkin methods very intensively. Okay, so a couple of remarks. The first is that uh, that function, in fact, it doesn't need to be exact. The, the, uh, the important thing is what is the behavior of that function in terms of the Peclet number. So it is linear with the Peclet number when the Peclet number is small, and it is uh, it essentially 1. That is the sign of the Peclet number, because here I consider either positive or negative a. It is 1 when the Peclet number is large. So essentially, I don't have a plot here, no. I don't have a plot, but the, that, function, that function behaves as follows. If you have here the Peclet, the Peclet number and that function alpha, what you have is more or less a slope 1 over 3 when the Peclet number is small and roughly a constant 1 when the Peclet number is high. High means larger than 3. Okay, so that's the, this. in fact, if you plot the exact, the exact function alpha, it, it looks like that, you know. It looks like that. That's the asymptotic behavior of that type of function. Uh, that's the remark I made before. That's the remark I made before. In the case of uh, if alpha equals 1, we have uh, backward differences in, this, in the space. Or, uh, in fact, they are called upwind techniques in the final different context. In the case alpha is, is minus 1 are, are forward differences. But in both cases, in both cases uh, they are upstream differences. Because if alpha is equal to 1, we assume that A is positive. If alpha is equal to minus 1, we assume that A is negative, velocity is negative. So in, the, in both cases, we have upwind or upstream uh, finite differences. So that's one thing. That's to obtain. That, by the way, remember, that, that value was obtained by imposing the local truncation error to be 0 at node i. So what does that mean? It means that the, that this, the error is going to be 0 at the nodes. So what will happen is that the approximate solution will be exact at the nodes because we are imposing the local truncation error to be 0. Okay? That's what will happen with this particular function. Of course, this is only possible in 1D and with simple elements. In general, when you go to higher order elements or to multi-D situations, it's absolutely impossible to obtain that, those functions. Okay. okay. Um, so, but uh, even if we don't have exact nodal values, uh, let's see what, uh, which is the value of alpha that could prevent numerical oscillations. And for that, what we can do is the same that we did before with alpha equal to 0. Remember, I said that when alpha is equal to 0, the exact solution to the difference equation is this one. So if alpha is not 0, what you get is that the exact solution is this one. So now we could say, OK, under which conditions can we prevent oscillations? Well, very easy we have to satisfy that this is non-negative. Because if this is negative, we will have a change in sign when m is even and when m is odd. So we, have, we want this to be, um, to be uh, non-negative. OK, so alpha, 
to preclude oscillations, if you impose that to be positive or non-negative, you get that expression. The critical value of alpha is this one, 1 minus 1 over the Peclet number. So when the Peclet number is very small, no, nothing happens. When the Peclet number is smaller than 1, what happens? If the Peclet number is smaller than 1, this is negative, so that's perfect. So uh, we, uh, all alpha, even 0, is greater than a negative number. Okay, even zero is greater than a negative number. So if the, if the Peclet number is, is zero, uh, or excuse me, if the Peclet number is smaller than one, nothing happens. But if the Peclet number is uh, greater than one, alpha has to be greater than this. In particular, when the Peclet number tends to infinity, alpha has to approach one. That's what we have seen happens with the exact solution. This is only for one dimension, in the one dimensional case, okay? What happens if we go to multi-dimensions? Okay. When we go to multi-dimensions, we also have an element, an element Peclet number. So um, a Peclet number that can be defined, defined in this way. Now A with that, those bars is the Euclidean norm of the velocity. So that's only the Euclidean norm of the velocity. H again is the size of the element, so the diameter of the element. And K is the diffusion within each element, constant, for example. Okay. Okay. So, what would be the extension, the straightforward extension of what we have seen in the one-dimensional case? This is, all that was explained for the one-dimensional case. So, we could do, we could just go ahead and try to add diffusion to the uh, multidimensional equation. And that, of course, was uh, tried, but the results were bad, bad results, in which sense in the sense that they were extremely over diffusive okay there was too much diffusion if you just add uh, diffusion diffusion for the one d case you could get the exact solution you know for the one d case everything was perfect you could get the exact solution at, at the nodes at the nodes however when you extend that to multi-dimensional situations results happen to be over diffusive very much over diffusive so what was the idea Okay, the idea is the following. The idea led to the so-called streamline of petrov golerkin method, the SUPG method. The idea is the following. I can write the, that equation. That, you, you see, that's the equation that I want to solve, in this case with S equal to 0. I'm, I'm not considering diffusion. I can write it in this way, where here, in this notation, um, sigma is the coordinate. It's a local coordinate in the direction of the velocity. And nu is the normal velo the component, okay? So in this case, the notation that I'm using here is the following. Maybe I will keep that equation. The notation I'm using is the following. I have a computational domain, omega, omega with a given velocity field, okay? A given velocity field A that I have assumed divergence free. Okay, so at each point, I consider a local coordinate system, a local coordinate system such that the direction tangent to the velocity field, so is sigma, and the normal one is nu, okay? I consider that local system. In the local system, the equations can be written in this way. Why? Be, well, first, the, uh, the system is orthogonal, so we have that um, the Laplacian is given by this expression. So second derivatives with respect to the streamline direction, second derivatives with respect to the normal direction, right? And what about the convective term? The convective term is nothing but the derivative of the unknown in the streamline direction and multiplied by uh, A, okay, by the velocity, okay, by the norm of the velocity. That's the only point that has to be understood is this one, okay? A gradient of U can be written as the derivative of u in the direction of a multiplied by a because a may have norm that is not one. Okay. But if you if, if we look at this equation, we see that there is again a competition again between a competition between diffusion and convection, but only in the direction of the streamline. Okay. The normal direction has no competition with convection, so to speak. Okay. We have to balance convection and diffusion only in the direction of the streamline. So the idea, the next idea was, instead of adding diffusion everywhere, let's add diffusion only in the direction of the streamline. Okay? 
Let's add diffusion only in the direction of the streamline. If we want to introduce then a diffusion tensor, not scalar, a diffusion tensor in the direction of the streamline A, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? In general, that, that tensor, how will be the expression of this tensor? In the system uh, sigma nu, in the local system of, of uh, uh, um, in the direction of the streamline and the normal to it, the tensor we want to add, let me stress that this is a tensor. I will write uh, a double underscript uh, um, underline here has to be the amount that I want to introduce in the direction of the string line and zero in the normal direction. That would be in 2D, in 3D the same, but with more components. Okay? That is the diffusion that I want to introduce. The amount that I want in the direction of the string line and zero in the direction normal to it. Okay? If you have seen the concept of the diffusion operator, or diffusion ellipsoid, sorry, the diffusion ellipsoid, you know that the diffusion, in, in general, the diffusion tensor is positive definite, in general, in, in the applications, in heat uh, uh, problems, in, in transport problems for the, for example, uh, yes, in general, for transport, it's, it's positive definite. If it's positive definite, there exists a system in which it is diagonal and with the eigenvalues positive, so it's, it's a spectral theorem, okay? Um, and you know that the, 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 in, in that system, the expression of that tensor is this one with lambda 1 and lambda 2 positive. So since the expression of this one is this one, we can plot an, an ellipse in 2D or an ellipsoid in 3D representing this tensor. Okay? How do we do that? So in the direction of lambda 1, we plot, in the direction of, of the first eigenvalue, we plot a segment of size lambda 1. And in the direction of the second eigenvalue, we plot a, a segment of size lambda 2. And it happens that if k is positive definite, the two principal directions will be orthogonal. And therefore, we can write the, the, those two segments will be orthogonal. And therefore, a way to represent a way to represent a symmetric tensor is this one, this ellipse. Okay? This is very popular, for example, in engineering, that uh, in engineering you have the, the many tensors that are, that are represented like that, like the inertia tensor, or the, or the or even the stress tensor can be represented in this way, and so on. Okay, that's the that, that the, this is called in in this case the diffusion ellipse or the diffusion ellipsoid. So what we are saying is that if we introduce only diffusion in the direction of the streamlines, we want that this ellipsoid in fact has has a major axis, whatever k prime, and the normal axis, zero. That's what we are saying. So the, dif the diffusion ellipse uh, degenerates to a, to a segment. Okay? That's what we are saying. And what happens with that diffusion tensor if we transform it back to the Cartesian system? If we transform it back to the Cartesian system, what we get is this. That's very easy to check. Uh, if C is the direction of the streamlines, in that case C, in general to any vector field C, uh, that value d, by the way, that's what I have called k prime here. That value d uh, multiplies c tensor product c or dyadic product. I don't know how you call it. That can be called tensor product or dyadic product. I don't know which is the terminology you use. So this is a tensor whose component i j is c i c j, okay, and normalized by the norm of c squared, just in case the norm of c is not equal to one. Have you ever seen that? Yes. Okay, are you all familiar with that? Any explanation is required or not? No, okay, perfect. That's just a change of basis. Okay, that's a trivial change of basis. Okay, so what we'll do is the following: we will introduce then a diffusion tensor that is going to be k prime, the diffusion that we know works in the one D case, times a uh, cross product uh, tensor product a divided by a squared. Okay. So that's what we do here. In fact, we can do it in any direction, in any direction. That's why I have left uh, C here, because that can be done in any direction. OK? OK, in any direction, this is true, although we will do it in the streamline direction. So let's do that. Let's do this. Uh, we need to introduce diffusion only in the streamline direction. Let's do this. So the problem that we will solve is the following. We will have, in the Golurkin method, we will have the convective term. You see, this is the convective term of the Galerkin method. 
we will have the diffusive term multiplied by k, and then the additional diffusion. Now, what is the expression of the additional diffusion? The expression of the initial diffusion is the diffusion tensor, that's the diffusion tensor written here, times gradient of u, that would be uh, the tensor k prime gradient of u multiplied by the gradient of the test function. Do you all see that that is the additional diffusion introduced in the direction of c, of vector c? Okay. Good. So, I'm going to play around with this. I have this expression. So, this term is kept here. This term is kept here. And now, there is, sorry, because that should be uh, uh, that is not written here. Why is it not written? Oh, this is misleading because that should be a C and that should be a C. But uh, I have replaced that by A. Uh, for uh, So, this is misleading. Sorry about that because uh, that is only true if C is equal to A, of course. That, l let me check that, that, that step from one to the other. I didn't notice that. I don't know if I, I put a condition on C. Did I put a condition on, of C? No, I just said tangent to a vector field C. That's uh, okay. So, let me check this expression. So, we have here, look at this, look at this term. We have gradient of B. I will omit the subscript, the subscript uh, uh, H. So, we have d, d is a scalar, so let's forget about d. In fact, let's forget about d over c squared, that is, that is a scalar, okay? So, we have c tensor c dot gradient of u, okay? What is that? Component-wise, component-wise, this is the, the, the i component of the gradient is the partial derivative with respect to x, y. This is the notation that I have used this morning. And then I have to take the, the j component of u, the, the, excuse me, the j component of the gradient of u, and here I have to put the ij component of c cross c, the ij component, okay? That's what it means. But it turns out that this is div, the ij component of the dyadic product is c i c j, derivative of, or with respect to j of u, okay? And now I can group together these ter terms and this term, and that is precisely c dot gradient of u, excuse me, c dot gradient of v times c dot gradient of u. Okay. So, sorry about this, that should be c. In fact, we will use c equals to a everywhere. So, you can replace c because I wanted to do generic for other reasons, but I made a mistake. I wanted to do generic for other reasons, but we have to take c equal, I mean, we will take, we will take c equal to a everywhere. So, imagine c is directly equal to a. So, replace c by a everywhere. So, here we have uh, d over c squared, c dot a dot gradient of b times a dot gradient of u. Have you understood that step from here to here, taking c equal to a? Okay. And what is the point now? The point now is that we have the convective derivative here and we have also the convective derivative here. Okay? So, we can group together this term and this term and end with this expression. You see, we have v plus d over c squared c dot gradient of v times a dot gradient of u plus the diffusive term. So, we see again the same that happened for the 1D case. We see that the convective term has been weighted by a perturbation of the test function for the, the test function by this function uh, eta or, or, or chi or whatever. What, what, what letter is it? Chi. Okay. So we have a perturbation of the test function given by this expression. Is there any question? So this is A. Okay. This should be A everywhere. A over C squared. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I, I changed the definition. What? what? What is the problem? Yes, I said that that should be A everywhere. Everywhere, A, everywhere. So, everywhere replace C by A everywhere. Okay? Replace C by A everywhere. 
So that's a uh, typo, let's say. Replace C by A everywhere. Is that clear now? No? Why is it not clear? Yes or not? Yes. OK. <laughs> OK. Good. So let's talk about units. That is what? That is diffusion. So it has units of length square over time. That is, um, that is um, well, that is convection. That doesn't work. That is length square over time. And this is velocity, which is length over time squared. So this is length squared over time squared. So what, which are the units of that? Length squared over time divided by length squared over time squared. Time. That has units of time. So we will call it tau. And remember that D, remember that D, the diffusion, D is what I have called before K prime. The diffusion that I want to add was alpha norm of A times H divided by 2K. Do you remember that? That's what I want to add. That is what I was adding in the 1D case, and that's what I want to add in general. Okay? So now it turns out that that parameter is going to be A alpha A H divided by 2K divided by A squared. And we'll have units of time. Okay? If I have A here and A squared dividing, what I will get is that. Is that. Okay? So that parameter is what I want to add to the uh, multiplying C or A gradient of B, okay? and has units of time. So the perturbation, the perturbation of the uh, test function only, in principle, only in the convective term is given by this expression. And that parameter is called intrinsic time. Okay? So that was called also intrinsic time. So which is the, the idea next? That still doesn't work very well. If you do that, if you add, uh, if you add diffusion in the direction of the streamlines, that happens to be equivalent to perturb the test function for the convective term only, for the convective term only, but still that does not produce good results. So what do you think is going to be the next idea, the next step? If diffusion along the streamlines still is over diffusive, and it consists in perturbing the test function of the convective ter term only. What do you think is going to be the next idea? Who guesses that? So we have perturbed, look at what I'm saying. We have perturbed the test function only for the convective term. What? What would, you, what would you do? I mean, just an idea. I mean, p the person who did that became famous. So <laughs> and he's still very famous. So, <laughs> well, he, has done, he has done many other things, but uh, what? Exactly. <laughs> the idea is to perturb also the diffusive term, uh, the test function of the diffusive term. But one has to be careful about that, because we said that we want our test functions to be in H1. In Do you remember that? So that test function is in H1 because it's continuous. However, what happens when you take the derivative of a continuous function that is only continuous? In general, that will be discontinuous. So we cannot take the gradient of that. We cannot take the gradient of that, of that expression because that would behave as a direct delta function. You understand? That's what we were saying this morning. So you cannot understand that that easily. You cannot, put, you, you cannot just put here V H plus uh, this term. You cannot do that. So you have to be a little bit more careful. So the idea is, the idea is again, uh, to obtain a consistent method by making that perturbation affect all the terms of the equation. For the right-hand side, by the way, there is no problem. So it's F multiplied by this term. But the problem is to give sense to that, the, to that term. Because uh, either we, we don't put G here, or recall that, that, came, that, came, that came from testing the Laplacian uh, against the test function. So the idea is, OK, instead of working with the weak form of the viscous term, what we will do is to assume that that only 
at the discrete level, not for the continuous solution, but only for the discrete solution that holds only in the element interiors. So in the element interiors, that is well defined. Why? Because UH in the element interiors is a piecewise polynomial. So if you, would, if you want to understand that globally, that is not well defined globally. Why? Because UH is only continuous. The first derivatives are discontinuous. And the second derivatives are Dirac delta functions. So globally, that is not well defined. But what we can do is to understand that this is a defined element by element. And we, what we finally get is this. So that's the method we finally get. The final method is we want to find u such that it solves this discrete variational equation where the bilinear form A is modified to ASUPG a and is given here. You see, we have the classical Golurkin term plus the convective term in the way we have seen, tau A gradient of V A gradient of U, and the diffusive term, but that is, multiplied, that is understood element-wise and sum for all the elements. Okay? That's the way it works. And for the right-hand side, we have no code. So for the right-hand side, we could delete the integral. Well, if f is h minus 1, we have to keep that uh, local integral. Okay? So that is the so-called SUPG method. What does it mean? Streamline map wind, petrov golerkin Why is the, that name? Be petrov golerkin because the test function is modified. So we have added that to the test function. And the streamline map wind because that perturbation affects upstream because of the expression that we have seen. So we are waiting, and somehow we are waiting upstream the derivatives. Okay? So this is the SUPG method, which was designed in the late uh, uh, 70s, but it's still used nowadays okay, in some cases. So maybe uh, it is uh, superseded, but uh, um, it's still used, and you can still use it, and it's, uh, it works well. Okay? So it's something that still can be used. In the case of reaction, in the case of reaction, uh, yes, that's my, I, 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 oops, I'm over. <laughs> Time is over. Okay, can I take two more minutes? In the, uh, in the general case, the theorem that we have is the following. In the general case, I, I will not do the analysis, although uh, it's not that difficult. Now it's well understood. After the years, after uh, 35 years, uh, it's well understood. And um, the analysis of that method gives the following, gives the following result, even for the convection diffusion reaction equation. So suppose that we solve this problem using the SUPG method. So the, uh, now we, we should add here a reactive term, SUH, okay, easy, SUH here and nothing else. If tau behaves like the, it is said here, if, if tau, the important thing is that tau has to behave like that. It is not necessary to take tau equal to alpha times h divided by 2a, so with alpha the hyperbolic cotangent of Peclé number minus 1 over the Peclé, no, 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 that's not necessary. What you need to take tau is like this. And this is very important to understand. C1, C2, and C3 are constants, algorithmic constants. Okay? And the important thing is that tau has to behave as diffusion over h squared, velocity over h, and reaction without a term. That's what is really important. And all this to the power of minus 1. Diffusion over h squared is uh, the inverse of a time scale. So that is length squared over time divided by length squared is 1 over time. This is one over time, and this is one over time. So everything is one over time, okay? And that the inverse of it, of course, has units of time. So that's the the time that you require for the inverse of the time you require in the diffusion step, in the diffusion part, in the advective part, in the for the reactive part. So if that holds, then you can prove the following: you can prove that the SUPG method happens to be coercive. The, bi or the bilinear form is coercive, the bilinear form is continuous, and you have an optimal estimate that says that the difference between the exact solution and the finite element solution is bounded by the difference between the exact solution and any function in the finite element space, in particular the interpolant. Okay? So this is the best you can hope for, that the finite element solution has the same bound as the best interpolant. You cannot expect more than that. That's optimal. What is the point? Hmm. Where, where, where is the key? The key is that the norm in which this can be proved is not the H1 norm. Is that, uh, that uh, 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 triple bar norm, which is given here. It has a contribution from diffusion, a contribution from convection, and a contribution from reaction. So what is what we gain with respect to the Golurkin method? What we gain is control on the 
advective derivative on the derivative along the streamline. So for the Galerkin method, we could get, I mean, if tau is equal to 0, think of this, if tau is equal to 0, then uh, we would get the Galerkin method. And for the Galerkin method, we have these, but this is useless because when k is very small, we don't have control on, on, the, on the derivatives. When k is very small, the derivatives are, under control, are outside, uh, without control. Um, okay. And if the derivatives are not controlled, we may have bounded values, but we may have oscillations. Okay. So it is crucial to have control on the derivatives. So that method does not give control on, the, on all derivatives, but only on derivatives in the direction of the streamline multiplied by that parameter tau. And that's what makes the method uh, stable and give good results. So the summary is we get the same as for the, Gal for the Galerkin method, but we get additional control on the streamline derivative. Okay? And that happens to be enough in practice. We will see tomorrow, um, uh, let's say, next steps. In fact, <laughs> Uh, let me advance that uh, the SUPG method is still used nowadays, but what will come next, that is in fact the next generation, which is the so-called Galerkin list squares method, I wouldn't recommend to use it. <laughs> we will see why uh, tomorrow. Okay? So that's it. Tomorrow we will continue.